Good evening and welcome to another part of uh, our study into the book of Psalms. Tonight is part three of a study that we have been doing in Psalm 119 and I encourage you, to, if you have not, to look at those uh, the first two lessons uh, and, uh, and that will get you up to where we are here. Um, as we have uh, discussed earlier, Psalm is unique because it is an acrostic. It has eight verse stanzas and each one of those stanzas can stand alone on its own as its own meditation or its own devotional. Each one of them has a unique theme, but there is a progression that you can be seen throughout the book of Psalm 119. Uh, in our first uh, part one, we studied uh, six of the stanzas and we saw that the first two were introductory. And then we saw a number of themes like we are strangers here on earth. Uh, we may be down, but we're not out. Uh, keep the end in mind, and we have to walk the walk and talk the talk. That was in the first uh, uh, lesson that we had a couple of weeks ago. I encourage you to go back and look at that. Last week we looked at five new stanzas, and uh, in those we saw that remembering God's Word was essential to spiritual health. That's what I saw as the first uh, theme in the first stanza. Uh, in the next one we saw God was all that we need. We also saw that learning wisdom uh, can come from our mistakes and it's a process and, it, and there is actually a process that you can see laid out in that stanza. In the next psalm, we, uh, in the next stanza, we saw using uh, that wisdom to not only help us in our path but also to bring other people along and to have them share in the joy of God's Word. And of course, God's Word is the basis behind all of the the lessons that we see uh, in this uh, in each of these stanzas and the last one was even when justice is delayed we need to have faith and we need to be renewed in God's Word <coughs> uh, I, I will remind you that during in the book of Psalms there are eight different words Hebrew words that are used to denote the the words of God like law and ordinance and and uh, commands and precepts um, and each one of them has a different meaning and as we go through our study when we see uh, one of those different words we will see how the, it, those using those different words adds depth to the text. Tonight's uh, study is, uh, uh, is from verse 89 all the way up to 129. So previously we've seen uh, there's been a balance between practical things that the psalmist can do uh, based upon the Word of God and we're also seeing things that God about God's nature and his provisions things that he has done for us through his word and through his loving kindness in the last stanza that we studied last week we saw that the attacks on the psalmist were intensifying and so the psalmist was calling for justice and, and, and will I live long enough and I'm paraphrasing will I live long enough to see that justice but in the end the psalmist was praying for revival and faithfulness tonight we're going to start with a stanza about god's nature and we see that this is kind of balancing that yearning that the that the psalmist has but it also helps to give context to his dedication and our dedication to god's word as we read it and as we apply it to our lives so the first section is uh, uh, the Hebrew alphabet is Lameth, L-A-M-E-D-H, Lameth. Uh, it's verses 89 to 97. And in this, I'll give you what I see as the theme, and you may come up with a different, different one, because God's Word is so deep. And we will, we will look at that tonight, that <clears throat> the depth of God's Word is just amazing, and we can learn so many lessons from it. So this first stanza that we're going to look at tonight, I think we will see that there is proof for the dependability of God and his unnature, unchanging nature of uh, his source of hope. So today we struggle. We live in the moment. And there are cares and the travails. This is a changing world all around us. It changes on a daily basis. I mean, who could have foreseen how the virus was going to affect our society and change it drastically? Uh, there's just change everywhere. 
but now try to imagine something that doesn't change, that, that constant. And what do we think about? We think about God and His constant nature. We think about His Word. We think about eternity in heaven and how those are constant. But how do we know that? Well, we know that because we have proofs in the Bible, and I think that's part of the message from this stanza that we will see tonight. In verse 89, we look at all of the uh, uh, we're going to look at all of the constants uh, uh, of, of God and his nature. We see in the first verse, he says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. And in that verse, in, in verse 89, that word Lord uh, is the word Jehovah. And if you remember, Jehovah is the God of promise. He's the God of the covenant. He is an unchanging God. If he commits to something, he is not going to change. And it says in that verse that his word is settled. It is unchanging in its nature. Um, heaven is also unchanging. Uh, it's unchanging by the mortal events. Things that we do down here do not change the events in heaven. It's unchanging as well. And how do we know that? And I think in the following text we will see clear proof of his constant nature and it, at the end, we'll see a contrast with man's nature and how it's not so constant and it, and it is changing. So the first proof found in this stanza of God's constant nature, his faithfulness is throughout all generations. Look at verse 90. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You establish the earth and it stands. The first part of that verse, we see that his faithfulness continues throughout generations start at the very beginning of time and the promises that were given to Adam and Eve were fulfilled thousands of years later. It all came true and that's the longest uh, uh, term in human time of, of where a promise was made and a promise was kept. But we also see it in multi-generational promises that were given to uh, characters in the Old Testament. And the most obvious is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The promises that God gave to them were established, and they were. he was faithful over hundreds of years to bring them up out of Egypt after 400 years to give them the land that he had promised to them, to make them a people, establish them as a people, as his people, and also to see the, the, uh, through his seed that the blessing uh, uh, was going to be a blessing for all of the world. We see in his law that there are blessings and punishments, and we see throughout over hundreds of years that those blessings and those punishments were borne out, and they were proved to be faithful and constant. Um, we see that in the restoration of Israel as well. When it was taken off into captivity, there was a specific amount of time that was going to go, go into pass uh, before uh, they were brought back, and that was down to the very time uh, it was the 70 years. And the, the temple was restored at its time. Uh, but the most apparent uh, proof of God's faithfulness across generations is found in Christ. If you want to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to read verses 18 and 19 in just a second. But Christ is is the, is the best example that we have of his faithfulness across generations. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes in verse 18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. God's fulfillment in the redemption of mankind fulfills the promises made thousands of years earlier. It shows God is not only powerful, but he's dependable, he's faithful across generations. Mankind, nations, governments could not stop God's plan. Satan could not stop God's plan. Time could not hinder God's plan. Nature itself could not stop God from fulfilling his plans. His faithfulness is proven across generations, and that's the first proof we have of the constant nature, the dependable nature of God.
The second one is found in the second half of verse 90 that we just looked at. You establish the earth and it stands. That is a proof of God's constant nature as well. He established the earth. He, with his words, established it. And we see in the timing and the power and the trust, the, the trustworthiness of the universe, the constants of the universe, that's all proof of his constant nature. I think you see, can see in the dependability of the seasons that that too is also proof of his consistency. So the earth itself, the, the way that it operates and the fact that it still stands is proof that God is constant, that he is faithful. The third proof is found in verse 91, and it's talking about this power of his words. He spoke the world into existence. Verse 91 says, They stand this day according to your ordinances, your words, for all things are, are your servants. So he spoke the world into existence, but he also spoke events into existence too that, that were part of his plans. And in the end, he will speak the end of all time uh, as well. His words are unchanging. And uh, the nature of his words are unchanging across generations. We look at the Bible. We look at this collection, the manuscript that we call the Bible. And it's a collection over thousands of years, but it's true to itself. But it's also the most dependable set of documents that, that man ever had. It is a constant. It is proof that uh, God is dependable. And we also see the sustaining nature in his word in verse 92. Uh, for your law had not, if your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. God's word has a sustaining nature to it, and that's proof of his um, constantness. So the I believe the psalmist believes that proof. I believe he understands it, that God is constant. And we too uh, have more, we, we have more insight into God's word than the psalmist did then because we can see the ultimate fulfillment of the old law in Christ. So we have seen that there are three proofs that God is constant and he has given us an unchangeable source of hope unchangeable something that we can always depend on and now in the last part of the psalm I think we will see a contrast here God's words which were extolled in the first part of it brought life brought life into being but we see in verse 95 that the wicked their words are out for destructions the wicked wait for me to destroy me I shall diligently consider your testimonies and 96, verse 96, is, has a very, very profound statement about mankind and that contrast between the constant nature of God. Here the psalmist says, I have seen a limit to all perfection. And he's talking about mankind. Your commandments is exceedingly broad. With mankind, I have seen limits to perfections. So why does everything man attempt misperfection well it's because mankind is limited in our knowledge and we're limited in our strength we're limited in our abilities we're limited in our vision for the future we don't know what's going to happen in the future we are limited in our purity because only pure can create pure and we're also limited in our longevity uh, we don't we're not eternal and we cannot see a thing through until the end until it's perfection until it is complete but God's word is broad. That's what the psalmist says. It's big and it's powerful. And you can see the difference between God and his dependability and man and his uh, inabilities to be dependent upon for good. So in this stanza, we see that it's a perfect follow-up for the escalating threats and the deteriorating nature of mankind that we saw in the last stanza. But we see here that God uh, shows why God is dependable. And those proofs are his faithfulness across generations, the creation that it stands today, and the word that it is constant, dependable for thousands of years. And as we saw in that last verse, it's bigger than life itself. It's 
broad, it's big. God's word can be depended upon. So now that we've seen this constant nature of God, let's go to the next uh, stanza, and that's Mem, M-E-M, and this will be from verses 97 to verse 104. And here the, ta the psalmist turns back to us. So we just talked about God's nature. Now <coughs> he's going to give us proof of the benefits of going deeper into God's word. Not just a casual study, not just a mere reading, but going deep into God's word. There are two, first, two verses that set the tone for this stanza, and that's verses 97 and verse 99. In verse 97, he says, How I love your law, it is my meditation all day. And 99 says, I have more insight than my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. <clears throat> In the first verse, we see the law is his meditation. That's that law that's described there. That's that directions, the guidelines. But even in the law, it is pointing to future times. Uh, in, in the second verse, we see that his testimonies, and those are the ceremonial rites, but they point to a deeper matters, things yet to come. Uh, when you think about that Hebrew word, which is translated testimonies. But most importantly is, what did he do with them? He meditated on those. So if you look at Strong's uh, definition, it is by extension a devotion to the Word. But it's also this meditation and it's coupled with prayer. The deepness of meditation lets us look into the context of what it meant to the hearer at that time. And we get that context by, by further study, by prayer, and by reflection. When we go deep into God's Word, we can see the application and how it could be properly used in our life. And I believe that's absolutely by prayer. If we are lacking wisdom, we pray to God and He will give it to us in abundance. Wisdom is found in each passage through prayer, but also we see that the goal of all of these passages is our perfection, not our becoming perfect, but, but, but becoming complete, that complete person that God wants us to be. So that's what meditation will give to us, going deep into the scriptures. And so now the rest of the psalm, based on those two verses that kind of set the tone about meditations, there are benefits when we go deep into God's word. So we're going to look at some of the benefits. So verse, first benefit is found in verse 98. And it is when we look deep into God's word, it makes us wiser than our enemies. There's benefits to looking deep into God's Word. We understand not only our priorities, but we understand our enemy's priorities. We understand their plan because God tells us how, uh, how the devil operates, but we also see God's plan and how it will pan out. We know how we are going to be tempted and that we are going to be tempted, but we also know how that we can defend ourselves. Uh, mostly, I think, though, when we look deep into the scriptures, we see how God is going to be with us and how he is going to help us in those times. And you see the last part of that verse in verse 98, it says, For they are ever mine. Um, so he, he's not just reading the words. He's owning those. They are mine. They are his way. They are his life. They are his defense. And so when it comes to his enemies, he has made God's word his, and that has made him wiser than his enemies. That's the first benefit. The second benefit is in verse 99, he says, I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. So when we're looking for wisdom, we're, we're looking for that deeper meaning in we're looking beyond just the mere rituals. We're looking beyond just the mere technical aspects of the law. We're looking for deeper meaning. We're looking for uh, how is this going to help us? And I think one of the best examples for us, especially uh, in our time and looking back on the New Testament, the best example of, of being having more insight than our teachers, look at the Pharisees. The Pharisees were great at the letter of the law but they totally missed the mark when it came to the meaning of the parts of the law. We too need to be good at the technical aspects of the law, but we need to look for that deeper meaning. What is God trying to 
change about our hearts, not just our actions, but about our hearts. So third, the second benefit is, is it gives us more insight than our teachers that are just trying to get us through the technical aspects. We look deep in the words, uh, we can have more insight than them. And the third benefit of going deep is understanding more than the aged. This is found in uh, verse 100. He says, I understand more than the ages because I have observed your prefect, pre uh, precepts. Um, so my uh, a previous deputy of mine, he always said uh, when, when people weren't acting right, he says, when age, with age comes wisdom, but sometimes wisdom comes alone. I'm not sure that's exactly what the psalmist is talking about here, but I think one of the applications that we could use to be more, have more understanding than the aged is, we can see the mistakes that others have made before us, and we can learn from God's Word how we can avoid that. When we go deep, we can under overcome those types of mistakes, those types of uh, problems. Uh, uh, we can look at the Old Testament. And we can look at the the parenting uh, flaws of like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and and we can learn from those. So we can have a deeper understanding than even the aged. The fourth benefit for going deep into God's word is the application of God's word keeps us on the right path. Look at one hundred and one. I have restrained my feet from evil, from every evil way that I may keep your word. <clears throat> uh, God's word, that deep study, that meditation, uh, we understand not just the, what we are supposed to be, what we are supposed to do, but we understand why are we are supposed to do it. And, those, uh, and why those commands are moving us closer to heaven, but also why those commands are good and beneficial to us, to our mental health, to our, our spiritual health, and even to our physical health. We get an understanding about grace and that we can never be per perfect and we need God's help. And when we fall, we know that uh, uh, we can get back up and we can start walking again with God's help. So um, the fourth benefit was the application keeps us on the right path. The fifth benefit from deep study is found in, I see in verse 102 and 104, and it gives us a clear distinction between right and wrong. So if you look at the last part of 104, he's talking about every false way. So that's the wrong, and, and then we see the right. So it's a contrast between the right and the wrong. Uh, God's truth, as we saw in the last stanza, is always is an, has an unchanging nature to it. And in this world, uh, truth is wishy-washy if you get outside of those who believe in the one truth, which is God and His Word. But we know that the truth that we believe in is backed up by science. We know that it's backed up by logic. We know that it's backed up by wisdom and by history. And again, the, the psalmist says that those false ways are uh, not only dangerous, but that we are supposed to stay away from them. There's nothing dependable about the false ways and there's nothing that is beneficial for us in the long run. It's only harmful when you take it to the end state. So I, the more I meditate on God's word, the more I see his truth and how it's providing clear direction and how his truth sets us free from bondage and how his truth gives us life and life more abundant. And I think that leads us to the sixth benefit of going deeper into than deeper than mere study, and that is application of his word it gives us insight into his thinking. How sweet are the words to, uh, to my taste? Yes, sweeter than honey uh, to my mouth. We should always have this attitude of gratitude. We should appreciate that God has given us his word because it shows that he cares. We should appreciate the depth of his word and all of the lessons that we can get out of it. Like you may be getting a different lesson, you may be getting a different meaning from these scriptures than I am. 
and the next time I study them, I may be getting a different meaning too. We need to understand and appreciate the completeness of God's Word. It is complete. It's everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness. So when we look to the benefits of deep study and, and deep meditation, it helps us to be wise and have understanding. It gives us directions. It uh, gives us truth. And it gives us an appreciation for God and His Word. So those are that's a great application lesson found in that stanza. <clears throat> that brings us to the next stanza. The next stanza builds on this thought, and since we have so many benefits from deep study in Nun, N-U-N, and this is verses 105 to 112, uh, we have reasons, we have a foundation for being faithful to his words. And so this, this next stanza is talking about being faithful. How are we to be faithful to his words and to God? So our faithfulness must be complete. It must involve our whole person. And I think in this stanza we'll see our feet and our speech and our, and our worship. It's all of us. And our faithfulness is built on that uh, unchanging uh, nature of his word. So first off, so let's look at how we can show our faithfulness. We first show our faithfulness by our walk. In the first verse, the psalmist says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Our feet must always follow the lit, lit, lit path that God has put before us in verse 105. Uh, we show our faithfulness by following that. By He uh, is the light that, he gives, that guides us. But we also understand that his light shines through the darkness. We, can, we will not be lost if we are staying in his light. And his light, his words, they never fail. So we must remain committed to staying on the path and keeping our steps in line with his light. Second, we show our faithfulness by our words. And this is found in verse 106. In verse 106, he says, I have sworn and I have confirmed it that I will keep your righteous ordinances. With our words, we commit what is in our heart. But first, we must fill up our hearts with his words. We show our faithfulness by keeping God's word, by making those commitments to God, but also keeping them to God and to others. But we have to be very careful about our commitments because we will be held accountable, and we see that uh, throughout Scripture. But we show our faithfulness with our words. Third, we show our faithfulness with our worship. If we go down to verse 108, um, we see that we uh, offer the free will offering of our mouth, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. So our, our worship shows our faithfulness uh, to God. Companion scripture to that in the New Testament is in Hebrews chapter 13. I want to read verses 15 and 16 because I think that we see that, that, that our sacrifice we are not to neglect. Hebrews 13, starting in verse 15, says, Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruits of our lips, that gives thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So we see in this passage here that He's pleased when we praise God, when we give Him the sacrifice of our lips, when we are thankful to God and we, we praise Him with thanksgiving. When we do good deeds, that is a sacrifice that is recognized in here. And with sharing, these are all sacrifices that God is pleased with. So we show our faithfulness by our worship, and our worship entails praising, thanking, good deeds, and sharing of God's Word. Fourth, we show our faithfulness with our memory. Remembering God's word is the first step to following it. In verse 109, he says, For my life is continually in your hands, yet I do not forget your laws. In, in Deuteronomy, um, there are over 15 times we are told to remember. So, how do we remember? Well, we remember by constantly listening to the preaching of the Word of God. We reinforce our memories with reading. We reinforce our memories by teaching others too, our friends and our family. We reinforce our memory by studying and that constant reminder of what God's Word has in store for us. 
Remembering is part of our faithful service, and it shows our faithfulness to God and to His words. Remember. It's amazing how many times we're told to remember in the Old Testament. Fifth, we show our faithfulness with the dedication under pressure. Not just with our dedication, but when, when things get tough, you know, we show that we will not uh, yield to that temptation. Verse 110, the wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not gone astray. Even though when the wicked lay a trap for us, we must remain faithful to his teachings. We must not return evil for evil, but we return good for evil. And that's not always easy to do. We also know... <clears throat> That when we are successful at doing this, at not going astray, that it builds perseverance and that perseverance builds hope. So it is a benefit to us to uh, show our faithfulness by remaining constant under pressure. And six, we show our faithfulness with our heart. And that's where it all starts. We first must put God's plans into our hearts and we must plant that seed, the word, into our hearts. And we must follow it from our hearts with joy as we see in verse 11 i have inherited your testimonies forever for they are the joy of my heart i have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever even to the end so when we obey from the heart we are serving god with spirit and, in, and with truth and we are also obeying all the way to the end we we constantly or keeping that in our hearts and what is in our hearts is what comes out in our worship we show our faithfulness with our hearts in the last two stanzas we have seen <clears throat> that there is much to offer us a deep understanding and wisdom can come from that meditation from that deeper dive but also showing our faithfulness by walking in the light by our words by our worship by our memory by our commitment and by our heart it's not always easy, but the reward uh, at the end is tremendous. But the reward can only be counted on if we serve a dependable and faithful God, and that leads us into the next stanza, Samek, S-A-M-E-K-H, and this is verses 121 to 128. In the next stanza, uh, <clears throat> I, to me, it's showing the dependability and the faithfulness of God. We've just shown what we're going to do to show our faithfulness. Now we're going to look at, uh, even when we don't live up to our faithfulness, that God, He will always be faithful. In verse 113, uh, 113 we, say, we see this contrast between um, double-minded and something that's constant, something that's faithful. In 113 it says, I hate... Uh, those who are double-minded, but I love your law. Um, we're seeing this contrast, double-minded versus the law. The double-minded are undependable uh, by the very nature of them. They're always changing. They change with the breeze. So a double-minded person is something you cannot depend upon. But God's law is constant, and it's true. And we've studied that from the ones before, talking about it being true across generations throughout eternity. So in this part right here, let's look at the dependable nature that's proven over these generations. Uh, so in 114, we say some of the dependable natures of God is that he is our hiding place and our shield. I will wait for your Lord. So we can depend upon God being there. He is our mighty fortress. He is our strong and sure protector. He's able to protect. He's able to defend. And the fortress, that hiding place, is not just a place to hide. It's a place to make a stand. And that's a big difference. It's a place to make a stand. And I think that goes along with our companion verse in the, in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 6, where he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his strength and in his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. That's Ephesians 6, verses 10 and 11. We're supposed to stand firm. We're not supposed to hide. We're supposed to stand firm. And having uh, God as our hiding place, as that fortress for us to go to, it gives us a place where we can make our stand. And in verse 15, you see, depart from the evildoers. That, the psalmist has made a stand, and he's telling the evildoer to depart from him, for I have observed the commands of God.
So having that, uh, that fortress allows us to make a stand, and we always know that God is at our back, and that He has given us the armor, and He is dependable as a defense for us and our faith. The second assurance that we have of His dependability is that He is de dependable to sustain us. In verse 16 it says, Sustain us, sustain me according to your word. <clears throat> And that sustainment that God gives us will help to see us through to the end. Think of it as nourishment, that sustaining nature of the, the nourishment that we get from His Word. It strengthens us and it, it gives us the, the energy to persevere. And that perseverance is what carries us through. It picks us up when we fall, but uh, it is that, that sustaining nature of nourishing us and we can depend upon God to do that for us. We can depend upon God in the next verse to uphold us. And that's slightly different from sustaining, although it, it does seem. But it's a, a, in verse 117 it says, Uphold me that I may be safe, that I may have regard for your statutes continually. He is dependable to uphold us, holding us safe in his arms, carrying us when we're weak, keeping us on that higher ground above the battle. That's what we can depend upon when we think about God and His dependability. He will be dependable to uphold us. We know uh, when the safety of our soul is concerned, He is dependable and He will uphold us. And the final section is 118 through 120, and we see here that God is dependable in His judgment. So it, it, uh, he, we know that uh, uh, He knows who keeps His laws, and he knows who are deceitful. And we see that in verse 118. You have rejected all of those who have won from your statutes, and for the deceitfulness, uh, for their deceitfulness is, is useless. God knows who those are, and his judgment, he will always do the right thing. Um, but we also can see that uh, we can be wandering away even when we have the appearance of obedience. And that was a warning that Isaiah gave them in Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13. He says, Then the Lord said, Because these people have drawn near with their words and they honor me with their lip service, but they have removed their hearts far from me, and their reverence uh, for me consists of traditions learned by rote. Isaiah 29 verse 13. They too had wandered, even though they had the appearance of obedience, uh, they were only deceiving themselves. So his judgment will be complete, and I think that's what we see uh, in the next verse, uh, in verse 119. His judgment will be complete when the wicked are completely removed from the earth, and that judgment is coming, and in verse 120, it's, that judgment is a fearful thing. God's judgment is righteous and just, but that fear of that judgment can also be a motivating factor to keep us from straying uh, and that is how we can apply it to our lives. This is a different word fear than the fear reverence. This is fear. This is terror. And when we think about the judgment that is due to the wicked, that should put terror in our hearts and should keep us uh, uh, on that path that God has put us on. So God shows his dependable nature in his defense of his saints. He's our stronghold. He sustains us with our nourishments. He brings the righteous, um, being a righteous and dependable judge, he also shows his dependableness. So as we strive to be faithful, which we did in that last stanza, there are things that we need to show, do that shows our faithfulness, we can take comfort in the dependable, faithful nature of God. And that leads us to the next stanza, a I a, a a-Y-I-N, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this, verses 121 to 128. So from the faithful nature of the last stanza, in this verse, in this stanza, I believe we can see some of the assurances that are given to us as followers of God. <clears throat> in this one, we see in the first two verses, these are unusual verses because these are some of the very few verses that his word is not mentioned. But we see the oppressors in verse 121, and we see the arrogant oppress me in, in 122. 
I think we see here that this may be uh, an abuse of a power against him. These may be people in positions of authority. Uh, and again, this is what I am reading from the commentaries. Um, but it's during these times that we need to hear that reassuring nature of, of God. And we get that from his word. The assurances that God gives us draw us nearer to him. And they keep us dedicated to him and to his words. So let's look at some of the assurances that we're given in this stanza. The first assurance is he is our surety in verses 122. In 121 he says, I've done justice and righteousness, but I get the idea that the psalmist doesn't think that's enough. He wants God to be his surety for salvation and judgment, but also at, in this time of trouble. He needs God not only to bail him out, but, uh, but he wants God to be that pledge that all things are going to work out well. When you don't need, in, in, the, in the court system today, you don't need a bail bondsman if you have sufficient money to post the bail yourself. So you don't have to have somebody be an assurity to you. So what the psalmist, I think, is asking here is for God to do something for him that he couldn't do for himself. He needs that surety because he lacks the ability to be that constant nature. So uh, it may point to judgment, but it also may point to this intercession that he's looking for. And I believe intercession in the surety uh, that we find in the Bible, intercession is a part of it. So let's, let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter 7. And we see that, uh, of course, the ultimate surety for us, the ultimate guarantor for us is Christ, and he does make that intercession for us. So look at uh, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 22, and we'll also read verse 25. And it starts in the middle of a thought. So much the more also, Jesus has become the guarantee for a better covenant. So he is our surety as Christians. Therefore he is able, in verse 25, he is able to save us forever, those who draw near to God through him, since he always, uh, he lives to make intercessions for him. So uh, we see here this, this surety, this guarantee also is making intercessions. So I think that we can see that there's some deep meanings here in that just that one verse in this stanza. Uh, we always have the assurance that Jesus is our surety and that he will make intercessions to us. So the psalmist was right to depend upon the surety of God. That's the first assurance. The second assurance that God gives us is that, and, and this is, uh, is that he is a loving master. In verse 124 and 125, back to Psalm 119. We see twice here that the psalmist refers to himself as a servant, which means he is subject to a loving master. And, and we see that loving kindness mentioned and also the understanding that uh, is, is to be given from this loving master. So as a loving master, we can be assured that loving kindness from the master uh, are found in his statutes but they're also found in the actions. Loving kindness is different than the word love. Loving kindness is an action that God does towards us based upon his nature. So we can depend upon that assurance of his loving kindness as our loving master. We can also be assured that he will pass on wisdom and understanding to us like we see in verse 125. And he makes the same assurance to us. We serve a loving master, and our loving master uh, promises to share love with us. He also promises that if we ask for wisdom, that he will give it to us. And this is in contrast uh, to the psalmist's way of life, which you, uh, which you see in 126. And the implication in 126 is that God will judge again. But now we have these assurances from... Uh, God. The assurance that he's our surety and the assurance that he is our loving master. What is our response to that? And we see that starting in verse 127 and also in verse 128 you see therefore. So up to that point it was a point that he was making and now he says therefore twice. He says therefore I will love, I love your commandments above gold, yes above fine gold. 
So we have this blessed assurance about God, his surety, his loving kindness. And because of that, uh, then we too can love his commandments. We can treasure them more than earthly things. We can protect his word uh, and, and make sure that we are cherishing it. But also we are to take actions that reflect the love that is found within his word. So therefore I love his commandments. We need to cherish those. But also we see in verse 128 that I will also esteem all precepts concerning everything. There's nothing lacking in God's word. And I will hold those up in high regard. I will revere them. I will respect them. There's two qualifiers here. All precepts and everything. And that's the all-sufficiency of God's word. And we will, if, if we are understand that God is our surety and that he is our loving master, then we too should esteem and should respect and should revere uh, all of God's word. And all other, in the last part of that, I hate every false way. Anything other than God's word is a false way. So when we see God's faithfulness and we accept the assurances that he has given to us about being the loving master and the surety or the guarantor of our faith, uh, we too can also love his word and esteem his word. So in these five stanzas, there is just so much that we can apply to our life, so much that we can use to help us to have a committed, more deeper study and meditation, to help us to be more faithful in the way that we show uh, our faithfulness and our walk and our talk and our worship and in our heart. But we also can look to the dependability of God and we can be assured that God is true to his word and his word doesn't change from time to time. We can look at this wonderful text in this and have great application to our daily lives and it's all based upon God's eternal word. And that's, and you see what through 119, uh, all but seven verses have God's word in it. And everything that we, all the benefits that we have through God come through his word and putting those into practice. And so I think we can take Psalm 119 and we can have lots of life lessons that we can apply to our lives. Next week we're going to study the last section, the last six of the stanzas, and then see how they all fit together and, and see how God's word can benefit in our lives and help us and, 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 and help us to grow closer to his word, but most of all to grow closer to God and our love for him and in our love for Jesus. Uh, thank you for your time. If you've got any questions, please send me an email. Give me a call. I'll be happy to talk to you about anything that we've discussed tonight. But I hope that you will take the things that we've talked about here. And, the, and we've kind of scratched the surface. Dig deeper. Take, the, take the, uh, the advice. Use that meditation and look for those benefits from meditating on God's Word. Thank you again for your time, and, uh, and I do hope that uh, you stay safe, and we look forward to seeing each other uh, very, very soon. So thank you for uh, your time.